We've been together. You're probably the friendliest church I've ever seen. <laughs> I mean, everybody speaks to us. And uh, when we first arrived in the parking lot getting out of the car, Mary Emma almost ran over us <laughs> to welcome us. And uh, I just think you're a fantastic church. And even when the words are not on the screen, you just you hum along until they come back and you're able to join in. It's so good to be with you. I thank your pastor, Rick, for inviting me. He's done and is doing, continues to do a great job here. And uh, he needs a break. Thank you for letting him go to Alaska, of all places, in the summertime. And he'll come back refreshed and uh, better able to minister to you. So it's a good investment. It's like coming home to come to this area. Uh, as Kemper told you, I uh, was pastor at Worsham Baptist. I was a student at VCU. I was 19 years of old age. And uh, Worsham invited me to come. And I went and preached for five years and met so many wonderful people, some of you. And uh, we're, we've been friends ever since. I met my wife, Audrey, who's here with me. Met her at Longwood. She was a Longwood girl that started coming out to the church, and it was love at first sight. When, uh, when, well, for me, when I saw her, it was love at first sight, and we, we began to date. And I think I can tell this now. I, I couldn't tell it for years and years, but when we realized that, that God was putting us together, we needed to go somewhere to talk about it. And uh, we couldn't go parking in, uh, in Farmville anyway, uh, because I was a pastor there. So we drove to Dillwyn. <laughs> and we found Dillwyn Baptist Church, went parking in the, and, and behaved, but we were in the parking lot and we shared our dreams of what God could do in our lives. And every single one of those dreams came true. Amen. Every single one of them. And so uh, it's, it's great uh, to, to come back to my roots. 50 years ago that happened. And uh, it's, it's good to remember that. You remember what you were doing Thursday of this week, 54 years ago, if you were alive? You remember what you were doing? You remember what happened on July 20, 1969? That's the day Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. I was a teenager. Our youth group on Sunday night went to Shoney's in Portsmouth, put a black and white portable TV up on the table, and we watched it. One small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind. David McCullough, the historian, taught me something in one of his books I'd never heard before. He said that when Neil Armstrong walked on the moon, he was carrying something with him. He was carrying a swath of muslin from the wing of the original Wright Brothers plane, 1903. It was his way of showing continuity between man's first flight and now walking on the moon. It's good to remember. It's good to make connections. We, we just didn't show up. Uh, there are those who've gone before us, and I'm thinking of faithful pastors who went before us. I served five churches in 50 years of ministry, and uh, they took care of me. Like, and I'm thrilled to hear what Kemper said about what you're doing for Rick. It's absolutely the right thing to do. Uh, churches took care of us so that when we came to retirement, we were able to do it and live comfortably. But so many churches, Southern Baptist churches in the main are small and struggling, and their churches cannot or will not put aside money for the pastor. And so the pastor comes to retirement age or his widow is there and they have nothing. And if they lived in a parsonage, they don't even have a place to live. And so many, many pastors are destitute now. They can't buy groceries. They can't pay for their medication. They're in dire need. Mission Dignity is what I work for. Guidestone is the umbrella organization. But uh, G Mission Dignity raises money for those pastors. 
And I'm not here to raise money today. I'm, just, I'm not going to take an offering. I'm just telling you about it. You'll find at the door and on the table here an envelope, and I wish you would pick one up. You take it home and pray about it, and you just put something in or not. But if you do, mail it in to Dallas, and that will help somebody in real need. Last year, we supported 2,200 retired pastors or their widows, Christian servants, to the tune of about $11 million dollars. And there's so many more out there. Maybe You're right now, you're thinking about an old pastor who had an impact in your life and you're wondering, well, where's the old guy now? Well, the old guy may be in dire straits. And so we can all have a part in it. I wish you would have a part in that. The Bible says, I was young and now I am old. And I can say that. I was young and now I am old. And yet I've never seen God's people forsaken or his children, their children begging bread. One way that scripture comes true is when churches like yours uh, do their part in putting aside money for their pastor to retire well. Uh, the scripture says in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17, uh, those elders or pastors who lead their churches well are worthy of double honor, especially those who preach and teach God's word. So you pray about it. Pick up one of these before you go, and I would really appreciate that. Turn in your Bibles now. Let's get into the word. First uh, Corinthians chapter 3. First Corinthians chapter 3. I didn't always want to be a pastor. I, uh, when I was a young child, I, uh, I wanted to be an architect. I, I, I loved drawing and I wanted to design houses. I would sit in our little duplex apartment, small place where we grew up, rented the whole time I was growing up, never owned it. I would sit in, in that little apartment and I would watch the situation comedies like Leave It to Beaver and some of those. I Dream of Jeannie and all of those. And, and I would watch it and then I would go to my little desk and I would draw a floor plan of the house those, that family lived in. And it was always better than where I lived. And, and uh, I would draw it. And, and where there were rooms that were never shown on TV, I would imagine what they were. And I would draw them too. I wanted to be an architect until I realized you had to know math to be an architect. <laughs> so I gave it up and went into the ministry. But uh, I, I was fascinated by that. Years ago, we were out in California and we went to Universal Studios. Maybe you've been there, not in Florida, but in Los Angeles. And we took the studio tour. And I was so excited. I'm a grown man, but I'm so excited to be on the tram. And I find myself on a back lot street where all those situation comedy houses were located. And I especially love when we got to the Cleaver house. I love that house. And they paused and I got pictures. Then we went to the corner and turned and went back the back street. And I've never been more disappointed in my life. You know what was there? Nothing. The front of the house was just a facade. When they did the TV show, it was done in a studio inside a building. It was just the exterior. There was nothing back there. And I thought at the time... That's a parable of our lives. A facade, a nice looking front, but there's nothing there. Could that be you today? You look good and you do, but is there anything real that's there? One of the greatest architects who ever lived was Sir Christopher Wren. He rebuilt London after the fire of 1666. He built St. Paul's Cathedral in London. He was commissioned to finish construction of the town hall in Windsor, just outside London. And he did it. And uh, the city fathers came to inspect the building, and they didn't like what they saw. They said, you haven't put in enough columns to support the roof. We're not going to pay you until you put in four extra columns. Imagine saying to the great 
the greatest architect alive in the world at that day, that he didn't know his business. They're just businessmen, bankers and merchants, but they're paying the bills. So he goes back and he puts in the four extra columns. The, the city fathers come and they inspect and they like it and they pay him. And Christopher Wren smiles all the way to the bank. He put in the columns, but if you look closely, and it's still there, the building is still there. If you, if you look to the columns, they go to within one inch of the ceiling. <laughs> they don't hold up anything. But you can't tell that. They're there for show. And I thought, is that the way my life is? Is that the way your life is? I'm, I'm talking to, to me as much as to you. What in your life is there for show and what is weight-bearing, what is real? Now, Paul thought of himself as a great architect too. Look at chapter 3, verse 10. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder. The word is really a wise architect. I laid a foundation as a wise builder, and somebody else is building on it. But each one should build with care, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is, because the day, and in my Bible there's a capital D, the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what is built survives, the builder receives a reward. But if it's burned up, the builder will suffer loss, yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple? and that God's Spirit dwells in your midst. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is sacred, and you together are that temple. Christopher Wren was an architect. Paul was an architect. You're a builder too. Every one of us in the house today is building something. You're building your family. You're building this church making it stronger each and every day. And certainly you're building your life. So is it for real or is it just a facade? If you're going to build effectively, authentically, you got to have two things. You got to have the right foundation. And then you've got to pay close attention to the framing, what you build on that foundation. Paul says, I have laid the foundation. There's no foundation that can be laid other than Jesus Christ. Well, Paul, yeah, there is. There are a lot of foundations people build their lives upon. Money, success, popularity, career, happiness. A lot of foundations. What Paul means is there's no foundation that will stand up. There's no foundation that's true and lasting. And he says what it is. The foundation is Jesus. So I want to ask you, just pause right now. Is Jesus the foundation of your life? Now, this means who Jesus is. Is who Jesus is the foundation of... Who is he? He's, he's God and man together. He's the eternal word of God. He has existed. He's, he created. He spoke the worlds into existence. He came to this earth at Christmas time over 2,000 years ago. He lived among us. He taught beautiful lessons. He performed miracles. And then he went to the cross. And our sin was placed on it. You know this. Our sin was placed on him and he became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus took away all that. The last thing he said was, it is finished, paid in full. I've paid the full price. They took him down, threw him in a grave, a borrowed grave at that. And three days later, he emerged victorious. That's who Jesus is. And when you have Jesus in your life, 
you've got the right foundation. The story is told of a Roma, ancient times, a Roman senator who had a falling out with his son. He was a wealthy man. He had a falling out with his son, and in his will, he wrote his son out, and in place of his son, he named a faithful slave to inherit all of his possessions. Marcellus would get it all. But in, a, in an act of kindness and, and to be magnanimous, he included this sentence. For his son, he could choose any one thing his father had, and he could have that. Marcellus was the slave. The son looked at the will and said, well, I'll take Marcellus. Knowing that if he had Marcellus, he had everything. When you give your life to Christ, you get everything. He's the foundation. So you've got to know him and you've got to experience him. It's not just Jesus in your head. It's Jesus in your heart and it's Jesus in your life walking and talking with Him. Do you know Him? Not just about Him, but do you know Him? My friend Joe McKeever is now in his 80s. He says, he's told his family, when, when I die, don't any of you say in the obituary in the paper that old Joe is now with the Lord. I've been with the Lord for decades. I've walked and talked with Him all my life. That's the foundation. Do you have this kind of foundation in your life? Well, I'm going to trust that you do. If you were brought up in this church or a church like this, you heard the gospel, and chances are somewhere, maybe in vacation Bible school, when you were a child or as a young adult, you said yes to Christ. David Lane was reminding me that... Uh, in October of 1976, I was in his living room sharing Jesus, and he gave his heart to Christ. And he, here he is. Went out the next day and bought a Bible. He didn't have one. Bought a Bible and has been following the Lord. I'm trusting that you've done that. That's the foundation. Now, Paul says, I've laid the foundation. Now somebody's building on it. Be careful how you build. And so I'm going to caution you. This is a word to Christians. You've got to build on that foundation properly. And Paul says, here are the options. You can use wood, hay, or straw, or gold, silver, and precious stones. Two options. And he doesn't, uh, he doesn't define the metaphor, so we gotta be careful here, but what does he mean? Well, some things are obvious. Wood, hay, or straw is cheap. It's flimsy. It doesn't last. It doesn't even look good. Gold, silver, and precious stones, that's costly. That's irreplaceable. That's of greatest value and beauty. What are you building on your life? In 1 Peter chapter 1, or 2 Peter chapter 1, Peter helps us with this. You might want to write that one down and look it up. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Through these have been given to us very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires." For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith. Now, be careful. You don't add to your faith to be saved. We're saved by faith through the grace of God. It's His gift. You just received it. You said, thank you. But still, we're to add to our faith. And here's what He says. Add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness mutual affection, and to mutual affection love. That's the framing. That's what you put on the foundation. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, 
They will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know any Christian who wants to be ineffective or unproductive. You don't want to be that way. That's why you're here today. You want to be effective. Well, put these things in your life. Goodness, patience, brotherly kindness, love. May these be the things that mark you. And sad to say, a lot of times those are not qualities that Christians are best known for. Any survey today that's taken uh, in the secular world about Christians, what do you think about Christians? It's almost always a negative perception. Hypocritical, judgmental, mean. That's the reputation. Now, it's not, it's not totally justified. In some situations it is, but that's how we're seen. Jesus doesn't have a bad reputation, but his people do. Build on this foundation with gold, silver, and precious stones. The option is wood, hay, or straw. Flimsy, cheap of no consequence. John said in 1 John chapter 2, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, what people are giving themselves to uh, unswervingly today, that's of the world, and the world perishes. And those that go that way perish. What are you building? You're a Christian, but what are you building? Is it just a nice facade? Or is it lasting and true? Now that matters because of one more thing Paul is very clear about. The day is going to declare it. The day, D-Day, capital D, the most important day, is going to be the day of final inspection. And there it will be obvious whether you have the right foundation and whether you've built with the right materials. And he says the fire will come. It will be sudden. It will be unexpected. You're, you're not ready for it. And, and there it is. There it is. Several years ago, Audrey and I were on a cruise like your pastor is taking, but we were in Japan. And it was an August, a beautiful August day, and we were in Japan, and we were off the ship in a marketplace, and at, uh, I looked at my watch at 11.02 a.m. There was a siren blast. And I thought, first of all, they were calling us back to the ship. It was time to go, but that's not what it is. Everybody, hundreds of people in the marketplace stopped what they were doing, and they bowed their heads. And then I realized what day it was. It was August the 9th, 11.02 a.m. It was the day, I, I, was, I didn't tell you, I was in Nagasaki, Japan. That was the day, the hour, the moment that the atomic bomb dropped. And I imagine it was a beautiful day like that and people were going about their business and suddenly the fire and mass destruction. Now what is the day he's talking about? Probably he's talking about Judgment Day. Judge, the Bible says we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Christians will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And you won't give an account of anybody else's life. You'll give an account of your life. As a Christian, what have you been building with? Or if you're not a Christian, you're at the great white throne judgment and the books are opened. And all your, all your sins are there. They've never been forgiven. They're all there. And the book of life is opened to see if your name is there and it's not there. You've never been saved. That's the fire. So that's probably what he means, but it could mean something else. The day a fire might be for you this week when your world falls apart, when your marriage collapses, when your children rebel, when you lose your job. Things are going smoothly now, but everything changes in an instant. You never saw it coming. 
And that's when substandard materials used show themselves. You know, the hurricane comes and everything looks good, and, but the hurricane reveals that the contractors were using substandard material all along. What will the fire show in your life? What will be revealed? You've invited somebody to church and they've, they've turned you down. They've rebuffed you. They weren't interested. They're not interested today. They're playing golf today. But Tuesday, they're going to go see their oncologist and get devastating news. And they may be interested in hearing what you have to say then. They may... And accept your invitation next time because they're looking for answers. A time of testing that comes in your life. Be ready for it. You know, Mark Twain, one of my favorite authors, was a great writer. He, he wasn't such a, a great guy. He wasn't, he wasn't a believer. He married a believer, Olivia, and uh, she, she wanted him to come to church and follow Christ, but he wasn't interested, and he used to make fun of her about it, good-naturedly, but he made fun of her, and finally, after a few years, she just gave up and said, well, if you're, just, if you're going to go to hell, I'll just go to hell with you, and then later, they had the devastation of losing an adult child to death, and they were inconsolable, and she especially. And Mark Twain said to her, Livy, if it will help you, lean on your faith. She said, I don't have any faith left. He had talked her out of it. Be ready for the fire, the final inspection. Jesus concluded the most famous sermon ever preached, the Sermon on the Mount, uh, with the story of two men who set out to build. And one, he said, was wise and one was foolish. They both had the same dream, a nice home for their family. The uh, wise man built his house on a rock. He dug down deep to find bedrock. And when he found it, he built his house there. The foolish man was in a hurry and he built on sand got in quicker. He got into his house quicker, moved his family in. Maybe they were neighbors. They were close by each other. Everything was fine in their, in their families and in their lives. But then one day they looked out over the beach and they saw a dark cloud gathering. And it got bigger and bigger and it's coming in and the winds kick up and the rain begins to fall. And it's a hurricane. And the hurricane comes in and beats upon those houses. The foolish man saw everything collapse. He lost it all. The wise man, well, he lost a shutter off a window. He, he lost some of his yard uh, implements, some of his yard furniture. That blew away. But the house stood. And Jesus ends the sermon by saying, if you build your life on the rock of, of, of my word, really of himself, you will be a wise man. I want you to be wise people. Give your heart to Christ. Follow him. Build wisely. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for your word today, and I pray that you will call us to a deeper walk with you. If there's somebody here today who does not know Jesus, may this be the moment that they say yes and take the free gift of eternal life offered by Jesus. And Lord, those of us who are Christians, may we give attention again to how we're building because the fire is going to come. The time of testing will arrive. May we be ready when it does. Speak to hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Kemper, I want you to come stand over here. We're going to sing a hymn together. And if God has spoken to you, why don't you come and uh, let us know about it. And if you want somebody to pray with you... We